Hello, everyone. And today we are honored to have Professor Harvey Kay with us. Dr. Harvey Kay is a professor of democracy and justice studies at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. He's an award-winning author of numerous books, including Thomas Paine and the Promise of America, The Fight for Our Freedoms, and also his <clears throat> magnum opus, The British Marxist Historians, the book that he's here to talk to us about. Um, Harvey, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure. It, it's, it, to me, it's fascinating that in this age of, I hope soon, the end of a pandemic, we're able to talk at this kind of distance from Australia mm -hmm. to the United States. I, I, I think Zoom is one of the better inventions of, uh, of the last several years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, so, Harvey, it's customary to ask our guests to introduce themselves. So can you please introduce yourself, tell us how you became interested in history, and also how this book, The British Marxist Historians, came about. I understand that this is a book that was published about 40 years ago, but this is a uh, the, the latest edition of the book. So tell us what has been added to the book and what made you decide um, to to revise and update the book? Okay, well, I'll start just by saying that I, I'm a post-war American baby boomer, okay? And my, my childhood was a fairly standard sort of child of, of World War II veterans. My, well, my father was a veteran. My mother had done some uh, volunteer, a lot of volunteer service during the war. And I grew up in a home that was decidedly what we would say in the United States, a liberal home, kind of home that would have voted for social Democrats. And if there was such a party anywhere in the United States, my interest in history, I think, was cultivated by my father's father, my grandfather, because he would often come out even before I could read. And he would read to me, believe it or not, Old Testament Bible stories. But he presented them as if in part as history, but also he would weave them together with his own childhood as an immigrant boy on the Lower East Side of New York City during the early part of the 20th century, sort of the 19 teens. So history may, it may not all have been history, but he gave me a, a certain sense of the past, which involved questions about exploitation and oppression and struggles to overcome them. And I wasn't aware of it at the time. That just seemed to me the way in which one goes about thinking about the past and probably ought to be looking at, at the present. Um, but history became my thing and with it, a, a certain interest in politics. And when I went to university, which I did in New Jersey at Rutgers, I was an undergraduate major in history. And then I, but I will also say I spent a um, few months as a high school exchange student in Quito, Ecuador. And the reason I say that and make it clear is that when I did go off to university to study history, most of my studies in the undergraduate years and my postgraduate years were actually in Latin American studies. So I did the BA in history with an emphasis in Latin America, and I spent six months at the National University of Mexico in Mexico City, which made me not only all the more fluent in Spanish, but basically embedded in the story of Latin America as given the times I was in Mexico was very tumultuous politically. When I was in Mexico, I had uh, I had explored the idea of going to Europe possibly to, to, to do graduate work in part because I thought that a lot of the questions I had might be better addressed by studying not in the United States, but by studying in some Western European country. Anyhow, I went to uh, the University of London as a graduate student, both University College and London School of Economics, and I emphasized in my study, I did a degree that emphasized international relations and politics, but I had a minor subject in agrarian studies of Latin America. And that lecturer that who supervised my work really started asking me questions that, that made me become all the more deeply involved in questions of class struggle in, in rural Latin America. And so I then switched fields again from history to politics. I came back to the States and I ended up doing a PhD. As I tell people, I went from LSE to LSU, Louisiana State University in the deep South. And Louisiana, we used to say, was the northernmost state of Latin America <laughs> because of the land, the, the history of, of uh, slavery and landlordism in that state. Having said that, okay, let me make it clear. So I did a dissertation on landlord and peasant relations in Spanish America. And in the course of doing that, I became very frustrated with the kinds of theories that were rendered to understand that experience and a, a significant historian in American slavery at another university who I was in correspondence with said, you should read the British Marxist historians. May not seem directly relevant, but believe me, it will make a difference. 
I did that after I read all of the work of the historian of slavery who was directly influenced by those historians. And when I came out with a PhD in the mid seven, in mid, well, 1976, the job market was terrible, but I eventually did get, came out to the Midwest to teach. And the, the curious thing was that I was trained as a Latin Americanist and I was teaching questions of social change and development. Development studies was really my, my interest, but I, I'm going to tell this little story. There was a, there's a market there, at least there used to be a Marxist literary group in the Modern Language Association. Okay. And as a student of English, you probably know of the Modern Language Association. Yeah, Emily. Well, every year for some years, they were running summer institutes, like summer camps for academic, for faculty in, uh, in literature and English studies. And a friend of, well, any literary studies, and a friend of mine at St. Cloud State University, where this was held, I had moved to Green Bay by that time here in Wisconsin. He said, you have to come back for the Summer Institute, even though literature was not my thing and theory was definitely, literary theory was definitely not my thing. He said, you have to come back because we're, the guest speaker this summer, the, the foreign guest speaker we're bringing in is Stuart Hall from, from England. And he's gonna talk about the big debate underway in, in uh, history and social science on the left about whether, you know, about structuralism versus historicism. And I, and, and I knew that it would be decidedly relevant to my interest in the British Marxist historians, even if that wasn't my major field of, of subject of study and subject of study at the time. So when I was, sorry if, I, if I'm going on about this, but people might be entertained by it. So I went to St. Cloud for a week. It was the week of July 4th, the big annual Independence Day celebrations. And there were about 50 people in this summer institute, and we all went to see the fireworks. And afterward, a number of us went back to my friend Bill's house. And among the group that was there was uh, Fred Jam was Fred Jameson, who in essence, you know, the big Marxist literary theorist, and he was the godfather of this Marxist literary group. And we're sitting drinking vodka. My dear friend Bill Langan was a professor of Russian and French, so he always and he always kept a bottle of vodka in the freezer. So we were knocking off this bottle of vodka. And the phone rang. It was midnight or maybe one in the morning. I can't remember. But the phone rang, which is a very strange thing to have a phone ring at that time. But it was Stuart Hall calling from England. And so for him, it would have been six or seven in the morning. But he was calling to apologize. He could not get come over to the United States because they were suffering budget cuts at the University of Birmingham, where he was at, at that time, the head of the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies. And he didn't want to come over and abandon his colleagues to, to have to handle these cuts on their own to figure out how they were going to manage them. So he couldn't make it. So next thing I knew, although I wasn't aware of it as it unfolded, my friend Bill got off the phone, leaned over to Fred Jamison, told him what happened. And without my knowing it, he volunteered me to speak in the place of Stuart Hall. And please understand, I was, all, you know, I was, you know, I was a young guy. My field was Latin America. I was very well read in the British Marxist historical tradition, but I was not necessarily prepared to go public with this kind of stuff. So I, uh, what happened was, I had a little too much to drink, and when Fred Jameson, who was, a, you know, the star of the occasion, said, "Hey, would you like to talk about the British historians?" and I, oh, said, "Sure," without even thinking. So I had, I think I had like 36 hours to prepare myself. So that morning that I was supposed to speak at 10 o'clock, I had a number of notes and ideas in my head to present. The person who spoke before me at 9 a.m. that day, I don't know if this name, again, I don't know if this name will mean something to you or not, but was a, a, a another major scholar in literary studies, Gayatri Spivak, who, okay. Now, the Marxist literary group at that time was overwhelmingly structuralist in its orientation. So their intellectual hero was probably Althusser and in political studies made Palancis and was that kind of thing. And the, I had read them, but I was not at all interested. Palancis was more interesting than Althusser, but Althusser I had no interest in. To me, it was just a dead end of theory. She spoke not on structuralism, but she had just come back from maybe months in Paris. She was gonna speak about post-structuralism, about Derrida, and if I'm pronouncing it properly, and when she spoke, I think nobody of the structuralists really understood what she was saying. So they were rather frustrated, maybe even exasperated by their own incapacity to understand it. But they 
but then I followed to speak and they understood everything I said because I was speaking straight historical English. And when I finished feeling pretty good about myself, I f what ensued in the question and answer session felt like I was being spat upon, honestly, okay? And at the end of that uh, spat upon session, I got up with the idea that I would slink away and you know sort of disappear for the day and not hang out with these folks. But as I walked away, Fred Jameson grabbed me by the arm and pulled me aside and he said, I really liked what you had to say and I think it's really valuable. Jameson came out of a Frankfurt School kind of education intellectually, and he he was not a structuralist, even though he was fully versed in that kind of rhetoric. Well, I came back to Green Bay, not sure what I would do. I think, oh, but, you know, he said, write up an article. I guarantee you I can get it published for you. It was that kind of thing. And But I just didn't throw myself into it because I came back to what I was normally doing. But that year, I had decided to apply for a, a seminar in the summertime, a, a, a workshop and seminar on labor and the industrial revolution, which was being organized at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, in Princeton, New Jersey. And I was accepted to take part in it, along with a number of economists and sociologists and other historians. The chair of that group, or the, the guy who supervised it and put it together, was a man named Bill Sewell Jr., who was a historian of France and very much a part of the linguistic turn in history. But he was a really fine historian and very much on the left. And when I arrived, to my amazement, when he had meetings with each one of us on the opening day of our gatherings, he, he said to me, Harvey, I hope you don't mind what I'm going to say, but you, you've said you want to make your summer project re reading about Welsh labor history. Because my wife is British, her mother is Welsh, her, my, her grandfather was a Welsh labor unionist. It was this kind of thing. I was doing it as a sort of to educate myself better to questions that had arisen in my life and in back in Britain when I was studying there. Well, the weirdest part was that he said, but I heard that you gave a talk last summer at the Marxist Literary Group on the British Marxist historians. Why don't you take the summer and every and all the work we're doing and write up a paper on the Brit the, a paper on the British Marxists? And I thought, wow, that's wonderful. That, you know, I had the notes really in my head. So I spent the summer doing that. At the end of the summer, Sewell said to me, after I gave my paper to the group, delivered it, he said, eh, that's okay, but you can do better than that. And I said, I could do better than that? What was wrong? He goes, no, no, the paper was fine, but you really should turn it into a book. So, I mean, the whole thing was like serendipity, serendipity. Came back to Green Bay and I was going into the library and I saw some new books on the shelf. And one, it was a row of books called Theoretical Traditions in the Social Sciences. And the editor in chief, the executive editor of these British volumes was Anthony Giddens, who at that time was the foremost English language social theorist. And I thought, oh, what the hell? So I took the paper and I sent it to him at Cambridge as a lark. And I thought, let's see what happens. I said, what do you think of this paper? Is this worth anything? Okay, to move on to a larger project. Two weeks, three weeks later, I got a book contract back from his publisher. Next thing I knew, I was writing a book, not on Latin American history, not on peasants and landlords in Latin America, but I was going to write this book on the British Marxist historians. That, in fact, is the subject of, of our conversation. And I spent sort of 1982, 1983 um, working on that as I was teaching. And also I had an opportunity because of the way the university op calendar operated, I took students to London in the winter of, I guess it was 1982 or three, I can't remember exactly at this moment. It's in the book I record. I recorded this experience. And in the four weeks I had the students in London, I uh, gave them one week off so they could go anywhere they wanted in Britain or Western Europe. And I had arranged beforehand to meet with Rodney Hilton, the medievalist of the group, Christopher Hill, the great historian of, of the 17th century and the English Revolution. And to my amazement, I never expected to be able to meet him with E.P. Thompson because he was so deeply involved in the European nuclear disarmament movement. And it was a wonderful experience. I learned a lot. I got Christopher Hill directed me away from doing certain things in the book and in favor of doing, uh, giving more attention to other things. The one historian that I didn't get to meet of the group well, I didn't get to meet Maurice Dobb and my stupidity. I didn't know he was still alive. And I'd only discovered after the fact that he was 
rather elderly, but he was still very much alive. So that was my loss. But the historian I really had looked forward to meeting in particular because of the diversity of his interests beyond Britain was Eric Hobsbawm. Because he had worked not only on British labor history, he had worked as well on European questions about social change and development. He had written those great works, The Age of Revolution. And I think at that time, he had also written The Age of Capital. I mean, this was this was a world historian in many ways. And especially because of my Latin American studies work, he had worked on questions in not only the Mediterranean, Italy and, and so on, but also in Latin America. And much of his work on primitive rebels had to do with his interest in Latin America and uh, peasant struggles there. But oddly enough, just for the record, Hobsbawm said he wouldn't meet with me. And I, and I, th the shorthand of it was, he said, surely you should just treat me like Frederick Jackson Turner, the American historian of the frontier. Treat me as if I'm dead. You don't want me moving around, do you? In other words, to, to throw you off. I was kidded with him when I finally did meet him, when he finally said, it's time for us to meet. This is several years after the book came out. And he wrote the foreword to the second edition. We became good friends. He, I said to him, you know, we would have met earlier, but you, you, you said no. And the way you put me off was to say you didn't want that I should treat you as if you were dead. And thank God you're not. And he said, no, I never said that. But I ran up, I ran, he came to visit, in fact, here in Green Bay. I came upstairs to my folder of letters and I pulled out the letter and I showed him this was exactly what he, what he did. Well, anyhow, so I wrote the book and, and I, at that point, my entire career changed. And indeed, I became the historiographer of the British Marxists. And I would, in fact, um, to make the, again, the longer story short, I, Christopher Hill had said that I should include in the book two other historians who I could not fit given my contract. Uh, what George Rude, okay, a historian of 18th century and 18th century England and France, the great historian of social and popular movements in London and Paris. I mean, and an extraordinary teacher and an outstanding historian. And later, we, we he honored me by making me the executor of his literary estate. And the other historian was Victor Kiernan, V.G. Kiernan whose specialty was not not the kind of history most of them had written. Actually, Kiernan almost had no specialty. He was even more than a Hobsbawm. He was the most global intellectually and geographically of the historians that, that one could imagine. I mean, he, writ, he had written more articles than probably anyone alive. He had written books on any every subject imaginable. But um, I ended up returning to, to what I promised Christopher Hill I would do, writing about Rude and ended up editing some of his work and bringing out some books with him. And similarly with Victor Kiernan, and I'm making a very long story short, and I apologize for going on like this, but Kiernan actually gave me responsibility to, to take charge of publishing three volumes of his essays. Uh, one volume on imperialism, one volume on nationalism, and one volume on basically what I titled Poets, Politics, and the People. And I can tell you, because of all this work I did, I always felt like I was a graduate student, that as much as I was a professor in the classroom, that intellectually I was a grad student. And a second volume came out, The Education of Desire, subtitled Marxist and the Writing of History, which won the Isaac Deutscher Memorial Prize in 1992 or three. And... Uh, I, I never looked back. I never did get back to Latin American studies. However, just to make the, the biography work here, all of the historians that I came to know kept saying, okay, you've read us. We've taught you how to ask questions about class and social struggle. Now go write some American history. That's what they said. So without going into detail about it, I returned to my childhood hero that my grandfather introduced me to when I was 10 years old, Thomas Paine. And in the early 90s, in, in both editing a book on American radicals and then eventually doing a book for young people, young adults on Thomas Paine that won an award from the New York Public Library, Thomas Paine, uh, Firebrand of Revolution. I ended up writing a full-scale work on Thomas Paine that came out in 2005 and it's titled Thomas Paine and the Promise of America. And I tell the story not only of Paine's life and labors, but the degree to which conservatives of every sort 
for 200 years tried to suppress his memory in American in American um, history um, because they so feared the, the radicalism of his pen and how it remained so inspiring to people pursuing every kind of freedom and equality in this country. And I'll just say that I ended up writing a book that I didn't expect. It, was, it ended up being a book that retold the story of America through Thomas Paine's legacy. But anyhow, and from beyond that, I ended up writing about, about FDR and others. So there you go. I probably burned up half of your uh, Zoom time and half, half of the podcast. No, don't worry. This, uh, this was a fascinating story, fascinating story. And I'm sure our listeners will be uh, equally interested to, <laughs> to listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, uh, let us talk about the British Marxist history tradition. What is it that sets it apart from mainstream uh, uh, historiography? And why did you choose these uh, five British Marxists here? And for, for, for the sake of our audience, you did mention some of them uh, in your introduction when you were introducing yourself and you were talking about how the book came about. So you talk about five Marxists here. We have Maurice Dobb, Rodney Hilton, Christopher Hill, Eric Hobsbawm, and E.P. Thompson. So can you tell right. us about their contribution to British Marxist uh, historiography? Okay, so we now we've got a whole series of questions. Okay, so let, <laughs> let's take it up. Let, let's start, let, I'll explain, first of all, as a group, as a yeah. cohort. Okay, and basically they were all of about the same age, except for Dobb, who was their elder, their a senior. They, and I'll just point out, there were three British British Marxists, in, in English Marxists in particular, who were in the 1930s, who would shape this cohort. One was Maurice Dobb, who would come to write the book Studies in the Development of Capitalism, which is really an argument about the, what enables feudal, what brings an end to feudalism and the making of capitalism which is part of a debate that in, that involves con the consideration of Max Weber's Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, Henri, the Belgian historian Henri Perrin's arguments about how capitalism developed, and I'll come back to that briefly in a little while. Um, anyhow, so that's Dobb for a start, and he pretty much was the one who said, in essence, he ends up setting the agenda when it comes to historical and theoretical problematic, that is, the transition to capitalism and the making of capitalism, and also the fact, the emphasis on understanding, as Marx put it, that the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle. A second major influence on the group is another older historian who is also their peer for many years. Um, his name was uh, Leslie Morton, A.L. Morton, who's best known for his book, popular book, A People's History of England, that was available for many, many years, probably still available. Um, not a very sophisticated telling of British history, but probably of English history, but probably one based on a sort of basic Marxist kind of construct. And his contribution, you might say, was to actually have these historians consider the possibility of each in their respective uh, time period of, of, of focus to rewrite English history, British history, to write it in a way that both that on the one hand definitely attends to the question of class struggle, but also the role that common people, to use the ordinary expression, had in the making of that history, as opposed to the fairly standard way in which history had been written for so long, perhaps going all the way back to the Middle Ages, okay, in the days of the chroniclers. That is that the history is made, of course, by the elites. Okay, which in the modern period, you know, would refer to not just the kings and queens, and but also statesmen, uh, political leaders, uh, uh, leading business officials, those kinds of figures. Okay, and that that's the history that mattered. In contrast, this would be a, a, a grander, more total history, total in the sense of both those who ruled and those who were ruled, those who exploited and those who resisted or struggled to escape from that exploitation. And the third figure, who really was, I mean, it sounds a strange way of putting it, was kind of like the mother of the group. I think she was the one who really gathered this cohort together, was a journalist turned historian named Dona Tor, D-O-N-A, Tor, Dona Tor. And she was herself a historian and a biographer in many ways. But what she tried to really inject into the group is the idea that they really should be, not just would be writing this history from the bottom up that included common people, working people in the story, 
but that they should have a certain kind of empathy for those very people, okay, as they write their history. And the other thing was, and given the fact that this, these folks at all, these British historians that I, that I worked on were especially young men at university in the mid to late 1930s, in the midst of the Great Depression, she was always emphatic that they should never believe, in spite of whatever the Communist Party said at any given time, that the best way to transcend capitalism in favor of socialism was to you know, depend on the idea of a crisis or a catastrophe. That, that, that history need not, sorry, that the making of historical change need not depend on crises. Okay, that they should not, it may well be that a crisis could lead to fascism, which it did in so much of Europe, as opposed to anything of a greater democratic or socialist sort. So these three figures are in many ways a, a sort of the godfathers and godmother of these historians. And these historians, having gone to university in the 30s, most of them ended up serving in some capacity during the war in the British war effort. So that you find, like in the case of Rodney Hilton, he served in the British Army. Um, Eric Hobsbawm served in like the Education Corps of the British Army. E. P. Thompson served in the tanks in Italy in in during the war. Christopher Hill, I believe, ended up working in the Foreign Office during the war, and so they they were all involved in the war effort. So you easily understand why their historical studies were stymied, okay, or or awaited the peace. After the war, uh, they came together. When they came back to finish PhDs and then and seek academic employment, they gathered in a group. It wasn't only in London. There were people from all over England, but fortunately trains could bring them to the meetings. They gathered in what was called the Communist Party Historians Group. And it was it's interesting to consider that the Communist Party Historians Group, in one sense, did not take orders from the party. They had a certain autonomy from the party as to how to write history. But the one thing that none of them did, which was really to, to avoid running headlong into the troubles with the party, is they didn't write 20th century history. They wrote, yeah, they, they wrote history of the medieval, early modern, and modern, but not the 20th century. That was clever. <laughs> clever is right. <laughs> so from 19, well, they gather, I guess, 46, 47. And they, they were very, very productive intellectually. I remember when asking them about their experience in the group, they all said that regardless of what they later wrote and learned later, or whatever that is that they overcame in the sort of basic years of their Communist Party Historians Group membership, their greatest education was participating in the group. The exchanges were, were really dynamic. Um, there was not always a consensus in spite of the fact they were they all were Marxists, all were members of the Communist Party. It didn't necessarily mean they all lined up and agreed with each other. They had you know, really significant debates on the English Revolution, on the role of the state in the making of capitalism. I mean, really, I mean, it sounded to and when they would talk about it, you could really see this not a well, maybe even a nostalgia, like what like those were days that too bad they were lost. This group survived for many years, but the key figures that I just mentioned, uh, sorry, I didn't actually, that you mentioned, that the, the, you mentioned at the outset. So we're talking about, especially after the after Dobbs, so to speak, Hilton, Hill, Hobswell, and Thompson, um, three of the four of them would end up leaving the party in 1956 as a sort of reaction to, and also a protest, a you know, reaction to the revelations about Stalinism, but also more specifically, the Soviet invasion of Hungary in 1956 to crush the Hungarian revolution. And so they left the party. What's interesting is they did not leave behind their commitment to, if you like, socialist possibilities. Uh, they remained very much Marxist historians in the way, in the questions they asked. Though I think at times, you know, they they, they were able to distinguish uh, some of the stuff they did from the, their earlier days quite clearly. Eric Hobsbawm did not leave the party. He stayed in the party. In some ways, the party left him over time. Um, and when he, the time he came to visit me that I mentioned in, in the first part of our conversation, we had spent the weekend together here in, in Northeast Wisconsin. He stayed here in the, at home with the family because he was giving a lecture at the university to my students and colleagues. 
we were up in Door County, which is a sort of resort area north of here. It's Chicago's resort area in many ways. And he and I took a long walk in the woods that afternoon of, after lunch. And we ended up in a, and I asked him why he stayed in the party whenever, when all of his closest friends and, and comrades had left. And he got into this very long set of reflections on why he stayed. And they include, first of all, he talked about a kind of loyalty and comradeship. But he referred to the fact that, you know, his, his first political activities back in the 30s were as a young leftist, you know, being, you know, challenging and then being chased by Nazis in the streets of Berlin. It was this kind of stuff. And then how, you know, his many years inside of of, of Marxist studies and, and and the Communist Party had 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 really created for him really close bonds of comradeship and friendship. And he just didn't necessarily see himself leaving the cause and the comrades, even though we know that some of his closest intellectual comrades had left. Um, what's funny, as I look back, is I not, we afterward when we stopped, actually, I guess we did that as a long morning's walk in the woods because it was over lunch that we talked. And I said to him, you know, Eric, what you had to tell me was absolutely fascinating, but I wish I could have tape recorded it so I could remember the details because he was very, very specific as he recalled individuals and moments. And he looked at me and he said, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I wish you had recorded it as well. Because when I go, if, if I ever get around to writing my memoirs, it would be helpful to remember <laughs> what I thought so important at that moment. And when he did write his autobiography, he does reflect on his reasons for not abandoning the party. So, so anyhow, so this group of historians in as part of the comrade, as part of their, you know, Communist Party historians group, they followed not the directives of the party, but the influences of Dobb in setting a problematic um, Leslie Morton in encouraging them to write history from the bottom up. OK, about whether they're peasants or workers or whatever. Well, that, the whatever is often done by historians influenced by them outside of Britain. But. And then by Donator in the sense of not reducing history in any way, not reducing history to simple minded, you know, expectations of, of, of crises and, and what would happen. So here's the thing. They were very productive in those years. And, and it, they also, in those years, launched what became one of the most important history journals in the world, at least in the English language, a journal called Past and Present, which was not a journal of the group but members of the group that I've just referred to organized it and brought in non-Marxist historians from the United States and Britain. And really, when I was a young historian in the 70s into the 80s, I always thought, oh, I'd love to publish someday in past and present. I didn't. It's OK. It's all right. But that was always like one of my sort of that was on my bucket list of academic things to do. OK, so what distinguishes them as a tradition? Well, these things I mentioned. It's also the case that they always carried on a dialogue outside of the Marxist tradition, but they really were determined to write a different kind of history, very much influenced by Karl Marx's thesis in the Communist Manifesto that the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of the class struggle. But to do so, as Donator put it, with a, with a certain empathy, if you like, for working people, for the laboring folk, okay? There was a, there's another historian who was friendly, at least with E.P. Thompson, a man named Barrington Moore Jr., who is a, a professor of, I believe, Russian studies at, at Harvard. And he once said something about how to distinguish, how to remain objective without necessarily, how, how to remain objective without giving up one's new, without giving up one's critical perspective. He said that you want to remember that the ones who've written the history all along usually are in some ways, members of the elites, or if you like, servants of the elites. And so it pays to have a certain kind of sympathy or empathy to understand the dangers of believing the things you've been told, okay? Um, or, as an, or to put it another way, as C. Wright Mills, the American the radical American sociologist put it, there is a difference between objectivity and neutrality, okay? Um, neutrality is impossible. Neutrality is impossible. Objectivity is possible. And what does it mean? It means you do everything in your power to recognize when you're wrong. So history from the bottom up wasn't to be a history of the bottom, you know, somehow outside of the ongoing class struggle. It was to be a history in which these people are enduring 
whatever exploitation and oppression exists, and the ways in which they might seek to resist, rebel, or at those rarer moments, even perhaps carry out revolutionary struggles to change it. Um, and so and so that, in many ways, is the sort of historical and theoretical problematic. Um, am I leaving anything out? I guess, you know, I guess that's what makes them a tradition. And in fact, I, what adds to their being a tradition is my generation of, of historians, the group, I wasn't, you know, I was undergraduate in the 60s, but those who came through as graduate students in the 60s and the early 70s, I think their influence upon us was powerful, mm. okay? At, I mean, I, for example, know the moments in which I rejected the standard social science and historical studies that tried to explain landlord and peasant relations. And I think that my experience was not all that different than others. And I, I was told by one of my peers that it would be interesting to do a content, to, to look in all of the dissertations in history published in the late 60s into the 70s and to see to what extent all the young historians, men and women, would have some kind of acknowledgement in their introductions or anywhere else that they owed a debt to the British Marxists. I, and in fact, he made the case that the most cited of the, all of the historians by my generation would have been E.P. Thompson because of his work on the making of the English working class. Now, if, if listeners have never seen the work, the making of the English working class, know this. It's a 900 page book that was originally contracted by the publisher with E.P. Thompson. Or maybe it wasn't even meant to be a book. It was meant to be a chapter in a book. It was that those 900 pages began as an effort to write a chapter, a, ch a chapter on British English labor history. But he just could not resist. So that in the course of the work, he goes from the late 18th century movements for what we would think of as democratic rights all the way up into up until into the Chartist movement, which he did not go into the Chartist movement of the 1820s and 30s and so on, in part because his wife, Dorothy Thompson, became a historian of Chartism. And I guess he didn't want to butt heads with his wife, Dorothy. And she was a powerful figure, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and I guess in, in this in this attempt to 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 depart from uh, from mainstream British historiography, that's where they also reject the Althus Althusserian model of oh yes, I did structure. Right, right. There's also at the very same time at the very same time. Now, this of course their their effort to transcend the standard British historiography is really a project of the the forties, the fifties into the sixties. The question of Althusser and structuralism versus, for lack of a better way of putting it, historicism or structures versus history and their emphasis on, if you like, agency in, in the making of human agency. That's really, that that's there in their minds in the 70s, in the 60s, even though Althusser is not necessarily the, the subject of their, of their controversies in the 70s. And the reason I say that is if you look at the kind of for lack of a better way of putting it, if you look at the theory that prevailed in history writing in the 1960s, it was something called modernization theory, which was true in development studies and in quite a few studies of, so of social history on Europe and even the United States. The presumption was that there was a process that had begun some point in the 18th and 19th century that involved, you know, the advance of the marketplace, the advance of technology, and along with the rise of an, of an industrial revolution and later a second industrial revolution. And that was called modernization. And that these changes and developments also involved a change in people's understandings of the world. Their, to use the French word, their consciousness, their con, you know, the collective con consciousness. And that had a kind of determinism if you like, a structuralism in its own way. The idea was there were these stages of modernization, supposedly, so that that the trick is then if you're going to transport that model of the past into contemporary times, if there were, as they often said, backward countries, how can you get them on the road to, mod to, the, to modernity? And the British historians generally rejected that, okay, in favor of understanding the, how class struggle shapes the making of history, how it even shapes the, the 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 if you like the emergence of industry 
and technologies and such things. But in the 1970s, when structuralism became so prevalent in Marxist uh, discourse, to use one of their own terms, um, the one who most angrily re rejected the Althusserian argument was, in fact, E.P. Thompson. Okay. And he did so. He wrote a book, The Poverty of Theory, which brought it all together. Long, it was his answer to a number of different structural kinds of arguments or th highly theor theorized arguments about history that he just could not abide. But what it came down to was that the British Marxists, if, if, to whatever extent uh, Thompson is their articulator or their spokesperson at that time, his feeling was that, th that structuralism was static. Okay, that there that it that especially it fell into this trap regarding class questions of assuming that there was this formula for the for how working people go from a class in itself to a class for itself. Okay. And and those and those steps were, you know, that you had that that it was a base superstructure model that would explain this development, okay that the base affords a certain kind of economic dynamic. And out of that dynamic, people experience certain kinds of, you know, workplace exploitation and so on. But the assumption was that the class would not really become a class unless it actually recognized itself as a class. So the base superstructure was too static and, and Thompson rejected it. He said, what Marx was about was not base and superstructure. In fact, a few of them said to me that that's all the that's caused more by Engels than it is by Marx. That that kind of model, okay, that when Marx dies, Engels become becomes all the more the the writer of historical materialism, and that Marx was more historically oriented, even though Engels himself had written some really good history on the peasant war in Germany and so on. But to come back to this, so they argued it by way of their historiography before Thompson even wrote anything about this specifically is that it was the relations of production was that the kernel of of that experience and that these relations of production if they were indeed relations of surplus extraction that is relations of exploitation okay that these were necessarily going to to if you like be class conflict ridden but even more than that and this is the thing is that Thompson made the point, which was already evident in the work of their of their hist of their historiography, that it isn't that you have relations of exploitation and then you have ideas that emanate from it in some kind of, you know, deterministic way. It's that we have to understand that even relations of production or relations of exploitation, relations of of, of surplus extraction, are themselves not merely economic. When we say relations of production, it sounds like we're talking about specifically economic relations. But I'll just ask the, this question. How could you possibly have relations of exploitation without a whole legal structure that validates it and whose forces of law and order are there to guarantee their persistence? People are not necessarily volunteering, uh, volunteering to become exploited. There's a compulsion, and that compulsion may involve ideological arguments, coercion, and so on. So relations of, of production, especially relations of extraction, will themselves be constituted by a whole host of, of you know, economic, political, cultural kinds of, of, of forces that are at work. So Thompson emphasizes that. The other thing he said is that class does not give rise to class struggle. It, there are, he says it's class struggle within the, con within the context of these, these relations of exploitation and oppression that do or do not necessarily give rise, if you like, to to some kind of collectivity and consciousness, right? But the other thing he said is that merely if they have it, it doesn't necessarily mean he would not fall into the Leninist trap here of saying that working people can only achieve so much and then you have to depend on intellectuals or the vanguard of a party to lead them out of their ignorance or out of their sort of acceptance of the world as it is. No, he says, we have to understand people's own understandings of the world within the context of those relations of exploitation, within their own, if you like, cultural trajectory, because people will, will, may well rally to whatever extent they'll rally 
together in opposition to those who are exploiting them, not because of some highfalutin, you know, Leninist theory or Marxist theory. They're going to do so because of something within their own culture, which den- which contradicts that exploitation. And in fact, what they all do very effectively is show the degree to which, whether they were peasants in the rising of 1381 or working people, you know, somewhat peasants or agrarian workers, rural workers in the 17th century, or for that matter, artisans in the late 18th century, they had their own traditions that led them to not just question, but to literally challenge their own suffering of exploitation. Um, it's always, It's interesting when you think about the standard argument about pe- peasant movements in the Middle Ages, quite often historians resorted to the, to saying that these were, you know, some kind of millenarian movements. They were crazed millenarian movements that that they were, in fact, there were those who practically made them into some kind of drug-induced, you know, um, uh, risings. But what Hilton does regarding the 1381 rising is, first of all, he notes the degree to which they were actually, they were actually serious peasant movements directed against the exploitation they were suffering and the taxation they were suffering. In other words, the impositions they were suffering. They had, if you like, their intellectuals, such as uh, John Ball. They had their political leader, Watt Tyler. And they actually had a vision of what they were fighting for. They were they knew not only what they were fighting against, the landlordism, but also what they were fighting for. They had a vision of the possibility of an England without landlords. They actually, you know, pushed for that very thing as the, as they moved through the countryside. Although they did say that they would allow for the existence of one lord in the land, and that lord would be the king. Their assumption was quite often peasants assumed the king was somehow, you know, more just than the landlords they had to experience. And then, and then if you go to the 18th, the 17th century, the English Revolution, Hilton, you know, whatever argument one wants to make, and I don't want to go through the arguments about whether it's a bourgeois revolution or not, but one of the beauties of Hilton's work, sorry, Christopher Hill's work, is that he notes the degree to which there emerges in the course of the English Revolution, which challenged the monarchy. In fact, as I used to tell my students, the English taught the French how to take off the head of a king in that in that revolution. Well, in the course of mobilizing these rural workers and artisans and shopkeepers, whatever they might be, to fight, you know, the king, the aristocracy, the, the, the way the world was 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 organized with bishops and so on they in essence raised questions in the minds of those who they mobilized as to what was really needed in england and you ended up with a series of movements first of all you get the levelers basically who want, who wondered why should not working men have the right to vote why should they necessarily bow to someone who supposedly stands above them and sits above them then you end up in the course of those kinds of questions being asked and being thrown as challenges, even to their own leaders, you get the emergence of a group called the Diggers. And the Diggers were those who want, who were, if you like, they were proto-communists. They basically thought that the land was meant to be shared. And they actually staged in parts of England uh, land invasions where they occupied land and began to cultivate it on their own. Their, their own leader who wrote quite a bit was Gerard Winstanley. People can look up his collected writings that, in fact, Christopher Hill edited. And then even at that time, and I'm sure Christopher Hill got into this particular direction because of things that were happening in the late 1960s, both in England and the United States and France and elsewhere. He said then, so you had the levelers and you had the diggers. And then there was this other group called the ranters, which, by the way, is still debated if there really were ranters. But ranters were, as, as at one point, he said, these were the guys who believed that God existed in everything. So everything was legitimate. Or as he said, sex and 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 whatever else one might wish, or you know something you covet, you covet it. Um, this was the turmoil of of as a consequence of that English Revolution. So, by the way, I do recommend if people want to read anything by Christopher Hill at all, they should read *The World Turned Upside Down*. It's a fantastic book. It reminds us that the Quakers themselves, the Friends, we would say were themselves part of this English revolution of the 17th century, the whole host of religious movements that emerged. So anyhow, you, I, I hope I'm getting the idea across that they, they ask these questions because that 
class itself is not static. It's not as if two classes exist and come together. Okay, they they emer class is an experience, as he would say, through the course of time. You can't understand you can't understand classes and their relations to each other without looking at them through the course of time. Or as I used to say to my students in a very simplistic way, would you want to have a photo of an event or a video of an event? And they say, well, a video, of course, because you can only understand what's happening if you see it in motion. I said, well, exactly. And if you really want to understand what class, class struggle, these kinds of things are about, you need to see them as they develop in the course of time, both in terms of the degree to which they continue to develop and explode, or they continue to develop and people continue to endure their suffering. And uh, we have sort of talked about most of these uh, authors and you've also said you said earlier that you've met with some of them and you have talked with them. Can you yeah. uh, tell us what do these authors have to teach us? How are they relevant to us today? Yeah, I mean, I'll, for the, for those, let's put it this way: for those who are historians, this might give them some added energy. When I did meet, when I spent a weekend with, well, a few days at the Eric and, and not Eric, Edward and Dorothy Thompson's home in Worcester, England. Um, besides being extremely helpful and a lot of fun to talk about history and politics with, there was a, a moment at the very end of my visit with them that was just really inspiring to me uh, that I want to mention. And then I'll also mention quickly after that, or I'll tell the story after that, of an experience I had with Rodney Hilton. So Edward and I were both going to London at the end of my stay with them in Worcester. And we drove down to the train together. And on the uh, at the train station, Edward said to me, I don't know if you want to sit with me or not. I need to sit in the smoking car. I really want to, I've got work to do. I'm going into, I knew he was going into London to debate an American strategic thinker. This is when he was deeply involved in the European nuclear disarmament movement, Edward. And so he wanted to, he was going to sit in the smoking car, smoke these little cigars he liked, and then uh, prepare himself for this debate on BBC radio that he was going to, going to have that evening. And I can tell you, normally in those days when you had to suffer somebody smoking, I would not have, uh, for anyone else, I would not have endured a smoking car. But this was Edward Thompson. And I was not going to give up every any minute of the of, of an opportunity any opportunity to spend minutes and possibly hours with him so we boarded the you know we got on the train and we were sitting opposite each other and we were looking i was spending my time looking at the countryside and looking into some work i was working a book i was reading basically and then at one point as edward's telling me about what he's going to be doing that evening he all of a sudden stopped and he looked out of the train window and he looked off in the distance to the hills, the, you know, the countryside and the hills. And he started telling me about the landlords, the gentry in that area and the kind of oppressive tactics they used to uh, suppress the poaching of deer or other kinds of uh, things that they considered to be illegal and unacceptable. So, and he got into this and he talked about, you know, the, about how, you know, these rural workers, you know, use certain opportunities to resist these landlords. It was just an incredible moment. And I and I thought about, oh, this must be Edward sort of feeling like, oh, if I could just go back to the study of history, you know, and not have to worry about defending Europe from American and Soviet weaponry. And then, and it was a great time. And I I still think that there was an element of that. But when I got on the plane to come back to the United States uh, several days later, I started thinking about that experience again. And I thought about it a number often since. And I came to realize that in some ways, it probably wasn't his yearning to be a historian again, as opposed to being a political activist and anti-nuclear campaigner. I think it actually had to do with the fact that he was recalling classic cases of English resistance to authority and oppression. And he was using that recollection, that, that remembrance to steal himself, to empower himself, to stand up to this question of the Cold War that evening. Okay. And I, and I never did get a chance to ask him that specific question. We did see each other again after that, uh, 
quite quite frequently, in fact, when I was living over in England with my family when I was on sabbatical. Um, but we never talked specifically about that occasion. I want to put him on the spot. So that I would say to people that one of the beauties of writing history from the bottom up and coming to appreciate the past of resistance, rebellion, and revolution is the degree to which it attunes us, okay, to our own, if you like, energies and how we might pursue them. But that that's okay. And for historians, you know, I, I think historians as they work, I could not imagine writing history without thinking of the world in which I live. To me, it's it's just that kind of thing. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, all of the historians said to me, you know, we've, we've, you've learned so much about this whole question of class struggle. Why don't you go write American history now? And I, as I said as well, I went on to write Thomas Paine and the Promise of America. But even before that, I kept asking myself questions about how conservatives hijack history, how Margaret Thatcher was hijacking history in Britain, how Ronald Reagan was hijacking history in the United States and trying to give the entire American narrative or in the British, in Thatcher's case, the entire British narrative, this really conservative spin. And I ended up working for quite some time in the late um, 80s in, into the 90s on the questions of history and memory. I ended up giving my Deutscher lecture entitled, Why Do Ruling Classes Fear History? Okay. Which turned into the title of a book of, of my essays and speeches, Why Do Ruling Classes Fear History and Other Essays. And for the sake of people who might get to see the visuals of this uh, of this conversation, I'll just show that this is the this is that book. Why do ruling classes for history and and other questions? Um, so, and then I ended up going on from there to write a book about Franklin Roosevelt and what has come to be called the Greatest Generation of the 1930s and 40s. And I I didn't write it to be a biography of Franklin Roosevelt. I didn't write it necessarily to just celebrate Roosevelt's progressive leadership of the Democratic Party and how he led the United States to radically transform itself in the 1930s in the Great Depression and to pursue a, a, a war effort against Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and imperial Japan by actually advancing democracy in America rather than, rather than allowing it to stagnate. But actually, I wanted to show how it was that working people in all their diversity in the course of the 30s and 40s actually gathered themselves up, inspired by Roosevelt's rhetoric, but actually to not just to, to fight the Depression and then fascism, but actually ended up pushing Roosevelt himself to go further in reform and radical change than Roosevelt probably ever expected. So they really did influence my understanding of the way history is made and the way in which I have come to see and write history. The other thing I wanted to say is that I had an experience with Rodney Hilton, which I just, it's, I don't think I go any week without having, without recalling this. So when the book came out, so I, when the book finally got published in late 84, it was, I guess, during that, uh, that winter that I took the students back. I took another group of students to London and when I was over there, Rodney said, you should come out to Birmingham so we can spend some time together and you can have, you know, we'll, we'll have dinner at the house. I said, great, great. So exact, that's exactly what I did. And when I arrived, he said, uh, I want to take you out for a drive around the West Midlands countryside. That's sort of to the west and south of Birmingham. Birmingham's actually sort of the capital of the West Midlands. And we, you know, we went all over the country, you might say. And we stopped for lunch in Warwick, England. And then he said, let's go down, let's go down to the church that I want to show you. We did, we walked the high street as it's called, Main Street, they would say in the United States. And we got to the Collegiate Church of St. Mary's, a medieval church, a beautiful, beautiful church. And we were walking through and we ended up in one of the back areas where there were these uh, tombs of, of aristocrats, especially a particular aristocrat and his uh, his wife. And I could look it up if they want to know the, who they were, but they can look it up themselves, the listeners, okay? But as we're there, this rather tall and muscular, you know, this big guy walks over. And I thought, well, what was he going to say? And he, 
it turned out he was sort of doing this sort of work for the church. And he said, uh, well, would you like to hear about the exploits of the Duke or whatever his title was of the Duke on horseback, you know, and Rodney without missing a beat said, no, we wouldn't, but could you tell us about how he exploited his pre peasants and how his peasants resisted? And this guy, this rather big man, looked at Rodney. And you could almost read in his eyes, oh, you must be communists or you must, you know, you're a bunch of radicals, you know, a bunch of social or whatever. But I, but I thought to myself how instinctively Rodney responded to that question, okay? And, and I like to think that that's how I have come to look at the world and that I can see the degree to which we've not transcended questions of class struggle. And I'll just finish in th that part of the story and say, look, here in the United States, also the case in Britain, but here in the United States, we've experienced 45 years of what Ralph Miliband, the great Marxist political scientist who was very close to the historians, wrote about in the late uh, 70s and into the 80s, and he called it class war from above. Okay. That there is a class struggle. Unfortunately, the class struggle is more is operating more effectively from above than it is from below. And the best proof of that is the fact that there has been an incredible concentration of wealth in the hands of billionaires. And the average working class income has not got wages have not gone up since the early 1970s. Now, what we have to see is the is how that kind of class struggle was able to be pursued. How was it that whatever movements of opposition emerged in the working class, how were they divided, suppressed? How were they distracted and corralled? And when I read about peasants in the Middle Ages or radicals and you know radical artisans in the 18th century, it attunes me to the diversity of experience and also the degree, how people experience and seek to resist and at times rebel, at least organize against exploitation and oppression. So the influence on me is, has been really powerful. I mean, I'm, I'm in my early 70s now, but when I think back over the last 50 years of their influence on me, I, I know what I owe them. And I, I in fact, somebody, people have asked me, I know you were going to ask me, so, you know, why did I bring the book out again? Well, I brought it out in part because I was asked if, if a new publisher could bring out this third edition. And I made it a point of sticking some of these recollections in my new preface to the book because I want people to read who read it to understand that the past does speak powerfully to the present. And it's also the case that in our own ways, we carry the past within us in ways we may not understand and appreciate. Uh, and just like you said, I guess it's a very it, it's quite timely to have this book with all the struggles that are going around in the U.S. all over the very world, much so. uh, right. even in England. Yeah, to go yeah. back and look at that tradition. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it, I mean, you know, just a few years ago, people were wondering if labor would ever find the energy. Nowadays, we've got Amazon workers, we have Starbucks workers organizing these are predominantly young people but not only young people we've had massive teacher strikes in places you would never expect them in the state of west virginia the state of oklahoma places like that you've had um i mean i'm, I'm you have this ongoing strike down in alabama among minors i mean it's just it's all over the place unfortunately the media doesn't it doesn't cover the stories very much so fortunately, there are alternative media, but not at all on the scale of the mainstream corporate media. But, it, it, you know, I, I've, we've got to attune ourselves to these things. Yeah. And, and um, this is a kind of a difficult question. I want I, I discussed with you off air that you have talked about five historians here. Some of them are really, really prolific writers. So what's the best place to start with them? And of course... The best place to start is the book, British Marxist Historians. <laughs> right. uh, and, and with people like Thompson, for example, of course, it is classic, the making of the British working class. Right. Uh, but in general, if people want to start, apart from your book, if they want to start yeah. to get a deeper understanding of these writers, and you also mentioned another historian at the beginning, George Watney. George Rude. Yes, Rude, I, I, sorry. I'll, 
I'll, right. I'll mention him as in, 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 in brief at the end. Yeah. So anyhow, my recommendation would be to read, first of all, as I mentioned during our conversation, Christopher Hill's The World Turned Upside Down. It's a brilliant study of, the, of, of ideas, of working, laboring people's you know, efforts to articulate their aspirations by way of their own religious beliefs or counter-religious beliefs. Um, E.P. Thompson, which I've, I could go on and on about, my big fear is people will pick up the making of the English working class as I originally did and said, how the hell am I going to read 900 pages, especially since I'm not a student of English history. But, you know, if you allow yourself time, it, I will tell you what will help you in reading Thompson's work is before he ever became a historian, he really wanted to be a poet. And there are places in his work that you should ask yourself, if you're having trouble understanding them, read them as if you're reading poetry. That's, the best thing I can tell you. In fact, when I would teach out of that book on occasion, and I didn't teach English history itself, I would tell students, you know what, take this paragraph and turn it. Let me see how you would turn it into poetry, you know, into into uh, into poetic verse. And and they came to understand it better when they broke it up in that in that fashion. Another thing I would tell people to do, which is, I think is just outstanding and fun to read is Eric Hobsbawm's Four Works of Modern World History. Okay, the first, the classic, is The Age of Revolution from 1789 to 1848. The second one is The Age of Capital from, I think it's, seven, it's 1848 to, oh, I'm blanking, 1875 maybe, something like that. And then the third volume, which he thought would be the last, because he thought he would not write 20th century history given his you know, original participation in the, in the Communist Party Historians Group. The third is The Age of Empires. Fabulous work. I mean, they're, you know, one could take issue with certain things in it. I'm not going to begin to do that right now, but they're phenomenal. And then the book that he didn't expect to write, which is in some ways maybe the most controversial now, is The Age of, I think it's called The Age of Twilight, which is his, or basically his history of what he called the short 20th century, which is from like 19... 14 to, I'm forgetting the, the next year, maybe 1989, something like that, 1991, that kind of thing, okay? You know, from basically the Russian Revolution, World War I and the Russian Revolution to the fall of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And then I mentioned to you when we were off air, there is a book by George Rude, who is very much a part of the historian's group who I later wrote about along with Victor Kiernan in, in essays when I was in introductions to their works that they asked me to edit. But I'll also tell people, I did write this other, I did produce this other book, publish it, The Education of Desire, Marxist and the Writing of History, in which I relate the British historians to the Marxist, the communist intellectual, the great Italian Antonio Gramsci. And also I have chapters in there on specifically Hobsbawm, sorry, not Hobbs, listen to me, Rude and Kiernan. It's a, I, it, it, I, it was a fun thing to bring together, this, that collection of my, of my writings. But George Rude wrote a book late in his, in his life, actually, titled Ideology and Popular Protest. And it's a, a sort of history of sort of Europe, and North America by way of the movements and struggles of working people. It's kind of a, it's a short, very short book, but he looks at, at how working people's ideas are articulated, how they generate their own, if you like, intellectual class, um, how this enables them to pursue protests that we today, if we weren't attuned to them, we might, we might ignore or not take seriously. And he sort of, you know, he includes chapters on the English Revolution, the French Revolution, and the American Revolution. Um, and it's really a fabulous read. It's great for students. So if you're, a, if you're new to these kinds of things, if you read that book, I think it'll be really advantageous in introducing you more generally to the work of the British Marxist historians, As, if you like. So start with my book, look at the education of desire. And then ideology and popular protest. And then in George's book, many of their writings that would be connected to ideology and popular protest are in the, um, the bibliography that I rewrote 
after George's death for a new edition? Uh, Harvey K, thank you very much for your time and for this fascinating conversation. I'm sure our listeners also tempted to pick up the book and read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you very much. It was really great for you to reach out to me from Australia to have this conversation. And I do want to tell people that even though Elon Musk has taken over Twitter, if they're at all interested in communicating with me, I'm on Twitter, very active on Twitter. Yeah. And my Twitter handle is at H-A-R-V-E-Y-J-K-A-Y-E, Harvey initial J-K-A-Y-E. Mm -hmm. And I do like to respond to people who follow me or try to engage me if I can. Okay. Great. Again, thanks. thank you very much. I've really enjoyed this set of recollections and ex 